animation, I maintain, is like the most incredibly powerful thing to do. When you're an animator, you are a god. I mean, you really are. You make the world, you populate it, and you bring it to life. I mean, that is fantastically powerful. What a great thing to be able to do. I believe in the physicality of puppet animation, and I would use the word magic, and use it quite specifically, and not just, not just all magic. You put on screen something which the audience knows it's a puppet or a doll, and they know it's alive at the same time, and that's, that's magic, I think. Dave and I met school. We met when we were 12 years old. One day somebody suggested that we should try animation. So we tried it, okay, and results were inconsequential but magical. Dave's father knew a BBC producer and he said, do some experiments and if you do anything good I'll buy it. And the first thing we did that was good enough was a rubbish superhero character that we called Aardman. Badly animated, technically a bit crummy, but good enough that, that he bought it. Perfect wolf weight. <laughs> We'd been working for this programme called Vision On, the show Folded, which was bad news. Happily, it came back in a slightly different form with the artist Tony Hart presenting it. The producer asked us to make a little, a comedy sidekick, I think you'd say. In his first six months of life, he changed quite a bit. If you look at the early ones, there's obvious sign is his head is a lot smaller and his feet are a lot bigger because he never used to be fixed down. The smaller the head and the bigger the feet, the better, the more chance it has of working. Opening up what we do proves to be absolutely crucial. And we employed two guys. One was Richard Starzak and the other is um, Nick Park. If you invite other people in, which is a good thing, it's also a rather painful thing because <laughs> that's my baby. The creation becomes the, the essence of you. Take a film like The Pirates, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit or Chicken Run, the film has a lead and that has to feel like one performance even though it's executed by probably 30 different people at some stage. So my job there, there interestingly, was to sort of try and get the best of that out of new people but corral them in as well because it, wanted, it needed to look the same. You know, it need, needed to feel like one character. That's one of the fantastic achievements of what the studio does here. We don't look like more for the end of it all. I'm occasionally asked to define what it is that's distinctive about the way we animate, or, or more generally, the way we make films. I think the very fact that it's British is defining. Almost all the animation you see on TV and movies is not British. When I can't put his eyes on, the joke is that after all these years, I haven't even got a systematic way of doing this. If I was doing it commercially, I'd have 10,000 eyes ready made, but the joke is I still do it this way. I don't look forward very far, but I do think that the studio is my legacy. We embarked on this process which is called employee ownership. The company is now owned by a trust. There's nobody that needs to see a fancy profit on the balance sheet. As long as we're viable and creative, that's what matters. Back in the day, the whole thing was like a balancing act. Avoiding him falling over was the number one challenge. Now, we sometimes put a skeleton inside. They do, those model makers. <laughs> if I look back at my career, and think, what have I learned that I could usefully pass on? The boring thing is practice, because it's an art and it's a craft. I think it's very like playing an instrument. It used to be very difficult, but now, because digital technology, you know, anyone with a phone can practice animation. I keep expecting and hoping to see the person that's been practicing every day since they were six, and they come out of college and they're really, really good. Ready for his letter.